Victor, would you like to get started? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Victor DeMassi, and I um, have a big interest in entomology. Uh, I've been um, interested in the Connecticut insect for about 45 years, the time I've lived in Reading. And about the year 2000, we had uh, the International Lepidopterist uh, Conference come to Yale. Someone's not muted there. Okay. Um, anyway, we had the um, International Lepidopterist Congress came, and people from all over the world who had been in the most the greatest places for butterflies and moths uh, showed up and I was chosen as one of the locals to give them a field trip around to our Connecticut meadows. So I was uh, quite nervous about that thinking to myself, well, gee, these people have seen everything. What am I gonna show them? So I took about 10 people, visitors from places as far away as Finland, Europe and others. And we went around for a better part of a morning or something and looked at the Reading butterflies. And at the end I said, well, you know, do you guys have any comments? And one of the one of the uh, people who'd come along said, "I never realized Connecticut was so beautiful," and uh, everybody agreed. So uh, I was very proud of my state and proud to show off our meadows. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Now we are having a few problems uh, with our natural uh, landscape, and we'll talk about ways to possibly address that. One of the things I did this year uh, in the pandemic, I uh, got involved surveying pollinating insects. Because as it turns out, in the state of Connecticut, um, working down at the museum frequently in New Haven at Yale, I, I found out that really no one had ever taken a meadow and surveyed it for the entire season. So I thought that this was an important thing to uh, have this as a base mark so we could use this to uh, you know, figure out how our meadows are doing and if they're improving, declining, what's going on. So let's go there. And this is, we're talking about what's called the pollinator pathway. This is the idea of restoring native vegetation to benefit pollinators. We talk about these things in depth. Now, talking to an audience like this, they want to know who, who is this guy talking to us about bugs? Does he have any qualifications? And in order to do that, I think I'll take you back to uh, 17th century England when the interest in insects really started to pick up. And the English, uh, well, they used the term macaroni. I think you remember Yankee Doodle went to town and what he, when he stuck a feather in his hat, what did they call him? Well, macaroni. And that was a, that was a very uh, common uh, derogatory term used to describe the people from Italy because the English loved to go to Italy vacationing in the 17th century. And they described these fly catching people they saw around England as the fly catching macaronis. So here we are in the present and uh, I am of Italian hem heritage. So that qualifies me as a macaroni and I'm out there collecting uh, insects. So I think that I'm qualified to talk to you. Now my spouse and I, Rowanna, we've gone all over the world uh, studying insects and collecting over 30,000 specimens for the Peabody Museum at Yale, one of the largest collections in the world. Uh, here we are crossing uh, the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean with an active volcano while we were on our way to the uh, northern part of the Amazon forest. Uh, this is supposed to be very dangerous for airplanes, incidentally. Uh, they can suck the dust in and go down. But I found, even though we've been in Africa and South America and all over the place, one of the best places is my own backyard. And how I got there was years ago when I was first getting married, I was a refugee from Stanford where they were tearing down all the buildings and putting up modern buildings. And I came to Reading as many Stanford refugees from that period did. And a uh, local real estate agent, quite well known, rode me around all day looking at houses that I could bring my new bride from California to live with me. And after she was getting quite irritated and finally at the end of the day, she said, Victor, I have one more house, it's a real dog, but you might just like it. So this was the house, we pulled up the driveway and I knew this was a place for me. This is what the backyard looked like where we're gonna spend some of our time today studying about the pollinators that live there. So um, the first year I lived in this house, I discovered several insects in the backyard that were rare in the state of Connecticut. So this has been a great place for me and my spouse and we continue to be there. 
to this day. In 40 years in, in Reading at this dog, uh, I found over a, about half the state fauna of butterflies in our backyard. So this is the idea of butterflies in the backyard. And you can see here uh, the yellow and black tiger swallowtail. The top uh, black swallowtail is the spice bush. The middle one is the monarch and below it the viceroy. So these might be some butterflies that are, uh, uh, you know, that you're aware of. But there are a lot of small ones there, not too showy, but they're still there and we're glad to have them. Now, in order to learn about the pollinating that I want to talk about tonight, we got to go back and um, uh, learn again or review all about pollinating. And, you know, you have to go to a children's book to get a good illustration, right? This is from some children's book, and it just shows the insect touching on the anther of the flower, getting pollen on it, taking it to the uh, ovule and the stigma of the flower and where that that pollen fertilizes the seed so then the flower will grow a seed so this is uh, a type of pollination that is affected by insects or other uh, agents that we'll discuss shortly now the other way that pollen gets around is it can be carried by the wind and uh, right now the trees are just really starting to get their pollen up that pollen gets blown around by the wind and uh, it, it will uh, you know, come from oak trees and maple trees and you've seen it on your car and you're gonna see it in your sneezing if you're one of those people like me who doesn't do too well with pollen. Here's a pretty good example of a heavy pollen fall, okay? Now don't get this confused with wind dispersal, okay? Pollination by the wind is a different process. Wind dispersion is when the seeds, the plant has developed seeds and it puts them on little parachutes and they blow away. Uh, this happens on the dandelions on your front lawn and it happens on milkweeds where they, in the fall, early fall, you'll see them blowing around. Now, one of the agents that we know, of course, is a pollinator is uh, the honeybee. And here is a honeybee it's just retrieved a whole mess of pollen from flowers. It's got a special uh, hind leg that is a, a pollen basket, and it's going back to the hive with the pollen where it'll be used to uh, feed the young larva. Now, don't think that only bees, I know what you're saying. Okay, you know, oh, I know bees are pollinators. Yeah, but did you know all these other things are pollinators too? Bats, especially in the tropics, Mosquitoes are pollinators in some cases, beetles, ants, flies. These are all things we found last summer when we were doing our pollinator survey in Reading. So don't have a limited uh, idea of what, what's affecting pollinating. All these organisms are. So this is kind of a breakdown and about 75% of pollination is, is affected by agents such as insects and those others I just spoke about and only about 25% is affected by wind. So if we don't take care of our pollinators and make sure they're healthy, we're going to, we're, we stand over the long term to lose a lot of our native vegetation and, and invasive vegetation for that matter. Now, it turns out that pollinators, different pollinators have really specific likes and dislikes. This is a uh, bee bomb, a red minarda, and this is only pollinated by a few agents. Hummingbirds pollinate bee balm. If you have hummingbirds around, you're gonna find they love this uh, bee balm. And uh, spice bush swallowtails, a large swallowtail, is the only swallowtail that re regularly visits this. So you're not gonna find a lot of pollinators here, but the ones that like red, deep florets are gonna start visiting. And it's similar to things like the cardinal flower, which is a wonderful, uh, flower, once very common in Connecticut, but overpicked. So it's not so common anymore, but you find it in wetlands and hummingbirds just absolutely love these uh, deep florets and, and visit it as does the spice bush volatile. So both of those organisms, spice bush and hummingbirds feed uh, are visiting similar flowers. Here is the spice bush swallowtail, uh, really deep in a uh, flower uh, going for nectar 
and in the in the meantime picking up a lot of pollen on its wing which will brush against some uh you know when it visits the next flower so this is how the pollen uh, gets around now there are a lot of different plants in our meadow and i did say that uh you know in making doing our pollinator survey last summer we found that it's very each plant has its own suite of pollinators <clears throat> one of my favorites is the common milkweed uh this is a plant and it, unfortunately these things are called weeds but uh they're wonderful um nectar sources for a, a bunch of different pollinating insects and they are also the food plant the solitary food plant for the monarch butterflies so monarch butterflies that come around are going to lay their eggs on a plant like this um i'm just going to take a little sip of water this is the swamp milkweed uh another common milkweed in in connecticut in western connecticut where we live and it is uh it grows in swampy to it can tolerate upland areas but it's more of a swampy type of thing so if you're planting your uh your meadow and you have a wet area this is the uh this is the plant to maybe think about putting there okay and here's the monarch coming along and paying a visit because that nectar is very important to the monarch as the food is uh, the the leafy part is important for the monarch caterpillars here is the purple milkweed and this is really the cadillac of all milkweeds as far as i'm concerned very rare in connecticut but it is around in our western part of the state and uh it's just absolutely beautiful for years i tried to collect seeds and every year as the seed pods began to ripen uh something bit them off probably deer so I didn't get seeds until last summer when I actually covered the plant with a uh, mesh and uh, whatever was getting to this, uh, flat, the, the seed pods uh, didn't. And so I didn't manage to get some, which incidentally I'm growing now and I'm getting a tremendous uh, germination on it. Now uh, in our pollinator survey, what we decided to do was we decided to take two different meadows and collect insects there over the course of the season once a week and those collections are now at the Yale Peabody Museum uh, in New Haven and what they are is they're a uh, they are a document of this time in history what insects are pollinating in our two relatively good meadows like I said my meadow uh, my my spouse and I our meadow had over half the butterfly fauna and Sammy, this is a Sammy Riccio, a, a, a young recent graduate. Um, she uh, did the Highstead Arboretum in Reading, which has a pretty extensive pollinating garden. So uh, teaming up like this, we, we managed to cover a lot of the space. Here was my helper in my meadow, uh, Lucas Curris, a uh, very avid 13 year old, really uh, tremendous uh, interest in uh, entomology. And you can see we're suited up here to go out in the field. Um, actually, absolutely adamant about him taking precautions against ticks. And he definitely got the message. And Lucas has had a wonderful time working. He collected over 400 uh, specimens uh, that are labeled and going to the museum, documenting pollinators in Connecticut. And I think he's probably going to be the youngest person to ever donate prepared specimens to our museum. So uh, this kid's off to a good start, young people. One of the things we uh, saw at the really highlighted as pollinators were these hawk moths. Uh, these are moths that, um, I'm sorry, hummingbird moths, not a hawk moth. The hummingbird moths, genus Hemeris, uh, there's five of them in Connecticut, three of them relatively common. And you'll see these at things like that red monarda. They really like those uh, deep uh, florets. And many people mistake them for hummingbirds. And I get calls every season about people having weird hummingbirds and stuff around their house but these are really a sight to see so keep an eye out for them and then we have the bees and this is a uh, bumblebee and uh the bumblebees are picking up the 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 slack as we have been losing some of our honeybee colonies to uh, uh diseases and um uh you know diseases actually there's like a, a bumblebee i mean a, a honeybee pandemic going around so uh, the bumblebees are kind of filling in. This is a bumblebee. I don't I don't know what this uh, species is, but it's not 
we didn't see anything like this in our meadow. We saw other bumblebees, which I'll talk about. But this is, they can be really quite striking and they're large and they're very important uh, meadow fl uh, flower visitors. So if you've seen a lot of these around, uh, you're in pretty good shape. Okay, here is the uh, a common uh, bumblebee, um, Bombus uh, impatiens. And this bumblebee seems to be increasing in, uh, in you know, commonness or we're seeing a lot more of them. And unfortunately, the other bumblebees, there were about 14 in Fairfield County, which I determined from examining historic collections. And we're not seeing many of those other species. So this is at least helping uh, fill in some of the slack. Look at that pollen uh, basket on the hind wing. It's absolutely loaded with uh, dinner. So that's going back to the hive. Now, you know, in talking about gardens, a lot of the things that come up with things like uh, butterfly gardens. And, uh, you know, we're not really just talking about any garden in the backyard because people can be avid gardeners and I salute them, but sometimes they just don't get it. A, a recent person whose house I was at, she was wondering why she didn't have any insects or butterflies in her garden. And looking into her garage, I just saw a, a shelf full of pesticides and tried to explain to her that, you know, you can't really be spreading a lot of that stuff around if you want insects to be comfortable. So we're going to talk about butterfly gardening as more a, a trait in preserving our native landscape, which is really quickly uh, disappearing to things like lawnification. Uh, here in Redding, uh, you definitely you see a nice house that had a, a two acre meadow around it and somebody new moves in and the next thing you know, they've cut down a lot of the big trees and they've uh, they've lawned it. And now what was once a wonderful diverse area has become just a lawn desert. Uh, the lawns are deserts as far as the uh, pollinating insects are concerned. So we're gonna talk a little more about butterflies and then use our knowledge of that uh, life history to examine some of the uh, things that are going on with butterflies right now in our environment. So in order to do this, we need to uh, revisit the butterfly life cycle. Up top, we have the butterfly eggs. Butterflies come along and lay eggs. Those eggs hatch out and they develop into caterpillars that can take anywhere from six weeks to even longer to develop. Uh, during their time, they eat a lot of vegetation. This, uh, something like the monarch caterpillar, this is a black swallowtail caterpillar actually, but uh, something like the monarch caterpillar is specific only to milkweeds. It can only eat milkweeds. The black swallowtail uh, caterpillar eats things in the carrot family. So plants like Queen Anne's lace, they have to be in the carrot family. So one of the things about butterfly gardening to increase the diversity of butterflies that you have is to make sure you have a diversity of plants that can act as food for uh, the caterpillars. The caterpillars go on to the bottom to become a chrysalis and the chrysalis that would be a cocoon in a moth. And then the chrysalis uh, develops into a butterfly. The purpose of the butterfly is the butterfly doesn't grow. Once the butterfly comes out, it's the full size. And the, the whole point of the butterfly is to find a mate, mate and lay eggs. Things like the tiger swallowtail, which you might've seen in your garden, uh, I did a 23 year study on those and those butterflies only live a few days. If they live a week, they're really doing well because the, every single bird in the neighborhood is looking for a, a nice, nutritious, protein rich meal. And, you know, the other thing I want you to think about and, uh, you know, uh, this, this whole process of metamorphosis going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, if you were sent from Mars and you had to detail life on Earth, would you ever get that a caterpillar was also a butterfly? No. I mean, you know, a little dog looks like a big dog. A little boy looks like a big boy and so on. But, you know, most life forms on this planet, they small ones look like the big ones. This thing absolutely changes. That caterpillar, when it finishes feeding, it's going to go into its, into its chrysalis and, and turn. So the eggs are, uh, are very uh, distinctive for different butterfly species. This is a butterfly called the comma, and it's laid its eggs. This is actually an upside down photograph. Those eggs are laid on the bottom of a leaf. 
And uh, you can tell the exact species of butterfly just by adding the eggs if you know uh, what that looks like. So, uh, you know, one of the, my great moments at the work in the, hanging around the Peabody Museum is uh, my comrade uh, there, Larry Gall, uh, who's an expert on moths. Uh, they were cleaning the dinosaur bones and they had a bunch of sand and, you know, that kind of stuff from the dinosaur bone cleaning and they put it under the electron microscope and he found, he found uh, insect eggs, uh, moth eggs from millions and millions of years ago. It was really an exciting uh, find. Uh, so that's part of the fun you have when you're around in a museum getting to be uh, the fly on the wall for such discoveries. That's the oldest known uh, insect egg ever found. Now, the eggs turn into caterpillars. Caterpillars are, again, very distinctive. This caterpillar that is on uh, Dutchman's pipe, this is the uh, pipe vine swallowtail. And uh, this, this swallowtail caterpillar is about, right at this point, is probably about as big as your middle finger. So they get pretty large. I was given a bunch of these pipe vines to plant in my yard. Pipe vine used to be common in Connecticut when it was planted as a porch plant because it climbs up on uh, trellises and stuff. And it has a wonderful flower that looks like the Dutchman's pipe. Uh, but it's kind of fallen out of favor. So the fruit plant is not widely distributed in Connecticut as it was in Victorian times when the butterfly from this caterpillar was uh, described uh, from Connecticut. Now, I planted three of these plants hoping that I would get the caterpillars to come. And I never, hoping that I would get an adult butterfly to fly by and drop some eggs. Um, for years, I would go out and look for the caterpillars, never saw anything. And then I was giving a butterfly walk in my meadow and, and, and this kid goes up there and he says, look at all the caterpillars. And we found over, we counted over hundred caterpillars of these things, yeah, all the size of your middle finger or large finger. So, you know, it was, it was really, uh, I've been looking for them for years and he gets to find them. I was a little steamed up about that one. Okay, so now it's going to change into a, uh, a caterpillar is going to change into an adult. And here's a monarch coming out of its uh, chrysalis. And just think of it, you know, a week before that monarch caterpillar, uh, you know, stopped moving around and uh, it became a chrysalis. And if you took that chrysalis and, and, and just crushed it, all it was was black goo. There was no indication at all that a butterfly was in there. So how does this genetic information get carried from this caterpillar to reorganize itself as a, uh, a butterfly, a totally different appearing uh, organism. It's really the most uh, fascinating process in nature as far as I'm concerned, okay? Just an opinion, but that's my opinion. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the uh, chrysalis of a swallowtail butterfly. And what's interesting about these chrysalises is that the swallowtail butterfly can color it's, uh, it's chrysalis to look like the environment. So this one kind of looks like a dead stick or something, but they can be really, really leafy green to fit in if they're on a, a you know, a green plant or something which they're feeding on. So, and, and you know, we're, we are losing some things, but we're also gaining some things. This climate change thing that's going on is tending to bring some uh, Southern species into our uh, environment that weren't here previously. So uh, this is, a really spectacular uh, giant swallowtail, bigger than any other swallowtail in Connecticut. I have seen this uh, south from New Jersey through the American tropics. I have never seen one in Connecticut. Every year I get people calling me up that they're seeing them and it really, that's another thing that burns me up. So I'm waiting to see my first one. I've planted the food plant, uh, which is the prickly pear. Now, what's the deal with this you know, giant swallowtail. Uh, why is this just arriving in Connecticut and staying here? Well, the case is that this butterfly is, the caterpillars are specific to uh, prickly pear. And uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, not prickly pear, prickly ash as anthozylum. And so they will only feed on prickly ash. And prickly ash is not very resistant to cold. So when a nice, uh, freeze comes along in late September, it turns prickly pear into prickly uh, ash into uh, black mush. You've seen plants wilt with the first uh, frost and the caterpillars, if they're trying to make a living on it, are going to starve to death and the butterfly 
uh, process, its life cycle is interrupted and it will not come back until some happen to migrate here again and once again, try to make it. Now we ha don't have uh, freezing weather until usually the first week of November. So prickly ash stays turgid and the caterpillars feed happily into the fall. They can become a chrysalis and then they can go through the winter as a chrysalis and emerge in the spring to fly around. Not in front of my face though. So I'm waiting, but they are becoming more common in Connecticut. Uh, you are definitely going to see this butterfly probably in the first few years. Uh, we correlate this with the temperature because in the mid 50s and also back around the turn of the last century, my daughter's reminding me that that's the last century now, uh, 1900, uh, these butterflies were uh, taken and seen frequently around Connecticut uh, in, in the Central Valley and uh, in Greenwich. Now, you know, sometimes when I'm off in places like French Guiana, I'm entering a forest. And one of the things that we're going to think about with the biology of butterflies here is that if butterflies are specific to certain plants, then lots of different plants are going to have a lot of different specific butterflies. And that's the case in the tropics where we have so much, such a huge variety of butterflies. If you go into an acre of land in French Guiana in the jungle, you cannot find the same tree twice. Think of that in Connecticut. In Connecticut, you go into the forest and it's all beech and there's a bunch of them and there's oaks and there's a bunch of them. And so our, we have a very limited uh, diversity of trees on any forest site. Whereas in tropical jungle, you have a great diversity and so much so that it's hard to find a, a repeat of the same species, a truly fascinating. But when we're in there and we find something like this, this is where I depart from the average butterfly gardener. The average uh, home gardener uh, sees this on one of their plants and they're running to Home Depot to uh, empty out the uh, you know, roundup section. Uh, I see this and I'm uh, spending my time looking carefully to see, hoping I have a new uh, caterpillar feeding that's gonna give me a treaty of adult. So uh, definitely a different look of things. Now, we are talking about the fact that butterflies are specific to certain plants. We talked about the monarch. It was specific to milkweeds. So the caterpillars aren't going to eat anything but milkweeds. This is a West Virginia white uh, butterfly, one that has declined greatly in Connecticut in recent years. It is very closely related to the cabbage white, which you might be familiar as a pest in your garden, eating your... Um, your broccoli and your Brussels sprouts and, and all of those things. And uh, this species of West Virginia white occurs in deep maple type forests, a Northern uh, forest where they're, they're very cool and it feeds on a plant called, um, uh, wait a second, let me see here. Dantarium. And, and Dantherium is also a member of the cabbage family, just like its cousin, the, uh, the, the cabbage butterfly feeds on cabbage family plants in Europe, unfortunately, mostly are cultivated ones. This one feeds on a very thing. This does not look like a plant in the cabbage family. You'd be surprised, but the butterfly comes along and the female uh, with her tarsus, she, she scrapes the leaf surface. She tastes the chemical composition. And she, gets the, and she gets the signal that this is the plant that's got the right, uh, it's the plant to feed her kids. So she'll lay her eggs on this plant as she's determined it's acceptable. Now, the unfortunate part of this is, here's the caterpillar feeding happily on dentarium in these little stands of plants deep in the forest. Fly in April on those few warm days you get in April. So you got to go to the spot where dentarium is and then when it gets warmed up a little, they fly along the ground uh, looking for their food plant. Uh, unfortunately, since they like the cabbage family, this is a, uh, one of the invaders that has come into North America from Asia and, and uh, Eastern Europe. It is garlic mustard. And garlic mustard, you probably know this from weeding it in your property and stuff. This stuff just takes over and forms sea of garlic mustard. These plants get very healthy and they're very persistent. The garlic mustard uh, 
is a uh, is in the cabbage family. If a West Virginia white, well, what happened in my population? I had two populations in Reading ever since disappeared. Uh, they were using a lot of sand on the roads, and a pile of sand washed into the middle of the forest, really far away from any road. Uh, but that sand is a disturbance, and before you knew it, garlic mustard was growing right in the dentarium patch. And a few years later, my West Virginia whites uh, disappeared from that site altogether. It's been documented in other populations that they are mistaking the cab the um, uh, garlic mustard for their proper food plant because it has the same chemical signal, and they lay their eggs on it, and the caterpillars starve. So something, uh, you know, this is how the biology of our local uh, insects is playing in. Uh, we're all we've all heard about the monarch. It's really a, a poster child of uh, butterflies. Everyone. All the kids know the monarch because it's been going on at school. Monarch, they're talking about the monarch being broken in recent years. In my lifetime, uh, the monarch population has gone from about 6 billion to about 500 million. Uh, and don't hold me to those exact numbers because it has been changed or fluctuating. But um, there's clearly a decline going on. And what's brought this decline is kind of a perfect storm of events. So we're going to look at how those events have teamed up to. Uh, go into the monarch decline. Okay, first of all, I want to look at what the monarch is doing. And, and this is, if metamorphosis wasn't my favorite uh, thing, uh, the monarch migration would be. All the monarchs that we see in Connecticut, as far as the Rocky Mountains, all those monarchs go to one place in Mexico every winter, about 100 acres in size, in the mountains of central Mexico, where a dense fur, fur, um, fur and pine-like forest protects them from winter freezing. They go into a torpor or as kind of a hibernation where their temperature is very low. They are alive. You can disturb them and they will start to fly and stuff. But basically, they're just hanging out there for several months during the winter. So you can see the orange uh, lines are all showing the monarch migration to Mexico. And that happens starting in September. Every single monarch we know takes off and starts heading south. You can lay on your front lawn sometimes on a nice September day, late September, and you see little orange things way up in the sky heading southwest, and that's the monarch migration. Areas along the coast like Cape May are famous where the monarchs come down at night to rest, and thousands and thousands of monarchs will be resting on one tree. It's really quite a sight to see if you get a chance. Of course, if you go to central Mexico, you'll see hundreds of millions of monarchs nesting on a, uh, hanging out on a few trees. So it's, it's really incredible that the boughs of the trees are, are bent down because of the weight of the butterflies. Now, in the spring, when things warm up, they mate. These, cat, these butterflies have been hanging out all winter. They mate and they start north. And the first batch will make it into places like South Texas and Louisiana, and they'll lay some eggs. Those eggs will develop into caterpillars and adults, and the adults will again we resume the migration northward. This happened, they'll, the next stop will be someplace like central Tennessee and Missouri and stuff like that. And ever northward, uh, we see them in Connecticut about May 10th, uh, traditionally. Well, they'll come stop in and they'll start laying some eggs and you'll get start getting monarch cats on your, on your milkweeds if you got a good supply of milkweeds. Those populations will continue north up into northern New York. As far as Prince Edward Islands, you can find monarchs uh, in the late summer, and all of them turn around and head to Mexico. The phenomena here is how do they keep the mem the memory through six generations after they just keep going north, 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 and then turn around and go south? I mean, it is truly a, a phenomena of a genetic instinct and stuff. So uh, good to know about that. It's a beautiful thing to experience. Now, uh, one of the things that has happened, uh, they've all migrated to this one spot, and um, there's been a lot of logging down in the mountains in Mexico. The trees are worth almost nothing. There's been attempts to just buy the whole area and preserve it, and Mexico claims to be preserving it, but still uh, there is illegal logging going on, and uh, that is diminishing the site where the monarchs can spend their winter. So that's part of the perfect storm. Their winter place is uh, disappearing. Uh, you know, monarchs are really tough butterflies. I mean, you don't fly from 
Prince Edward Island to central Mexico if you're a pansy, let's face it. Uh, so these things are often on my walks, I'll catch a monarch in my net and I'll be holding it. Uh, people are just shocked that you're holding a butterfly and aren't the scales going to come off and all this other stuff. And I just take the butterfly and I just squish it in my fist and everybody's shocked and possibly people there that want to kill me or do something, I don't know. And you open up your hand and that monarch just gets up and flies away like nothing ever happened. These butterflies are like rubber. Let me tell you, they are tough. Now, the other uh, part of the storm that's affecting monarchs is the caterpillar is very specific to milkweeds. And especially during the gas haul project in the 90s, uh, farmers were getting paid top dollar for corn and they started to plow up all the conservation uh, strips that they leave between fields in uh, places like Illinois and Iowa and Missouri. And, and they just planted fence to fence. And what happened is that though milkweed thrived in those conservation things. So there was a huge population of monarchs in the central United States, and they have really been harshed down uh, by all the clearing of the native milkweed. Uh, people are trying to rethink that now. And like I was reading recently in Iowa, they, they take milkweed seeds and put them in mud balls and drive around and throw them out car windows to try to get uh, milkweeds uh, going more to get more monarchs. But what used to be a huge migration in the central United States has now uh, been quite uh, diminished. And uh, the milkweeds, here is butterfly weed, a really spectacular member of the milkweed family. And we have about uh, four to five species of milkweeds in Connecticut that monarchs uh, feed on. But again, uh, milkweed, uh, the diminution of the milkweed has led to, led to the diminution of, of monarch populations. So. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're having a pollinator thing to get milkweeds back going here in the eastern United States. And the lawnification, of course, does not help that, but uh, some of us are keeping the faith. Now, uh, you know, it wasn't long before about uh, this plant shows up from basically uh, eastern Europe, the Ukraine and stuff. And it's a member of the milkweed family. It's called black swallowwort. And this plant is a plague and it gets into our meadows and chokes them out. And here is an example. It's, it bec becomes a uh, viney twisty thing that smothers all the other plants in the meadow and stuff. And it takes over. I mean, I saw my first black swallowwort in my meadow in 1982. I was all excited. I thought I had a nice new plant growing in my meadow. And in a few years I had this, it was almost a pure stand. And this only this crowds out all the diversity of flowers that all the other pollinators are are visiting. Uh, so it forms a monoculture. And also the monarch uh, about recent studies in uh, Rhode Island have shown that about 20 percent of monarch uh, butterflies lay their eggs by mistake on a black swallowwort, because, as I said, it is a member of the milkweed family. Although not, although not an acceptable food plant for a monarch. So you're getting about 20% of their eggs are being dead-ended on, on, on an improper host plant. So uh, what we're trying to do with the black swallowwort, which has taken over my meadow and we've since reduced through very tedious work, um, we, uh, you can't weed that thing too easy, I'll tell you. This, this is the University of Rhode Island people on the Next to me is Lisa Tewksbury, and she is head of the biological control unit at the University of Rhode Island. And what they do is they try to go places where the plant is from and find pests that feed on that plant. Or, so they went to the Ukraine. She sent some students to the Ukraine, and they found a moth that uh, actually lays its eggs and feeds exclusively on black swallowwort. Uh, Susan Robinson on the, on the lower part. Uh, was from the Reading Conservation Commission, and she facilitated, facilitated this uh, program to release these moths. Uh, that's Lisa's uh, a graduate student in the middle. I unfortunately forgot her name. But this is what black swallowwort looks like. Notice there's like any to none damage on it. I mean, nothing is eating this thing. It just grows and grows without anybody uh, taking it for a meal. So we've uh, Lisa came with a... Uh, moth that has, after 10 years of testing, they found it only eats black swallowwort. And she set up this tent 
and uh, released the moths in the tent. 10 female, uh, 25 females, 25 males. They made it, put down some eggs, and here's their caterpillars happily feeding on black swallowwort a short time later. You can see the, the two lines that through the middle of the photo are leaf stems that have been gnawed down to almost nothing. So uh, again, let's uh, look at that uh, difference. I wanna just uh, press this. That's swallowwort that nobody's touching. And this is good swallowwort because it's almost eaten to, to nothing. And uh, what we're hoping now is that these uh, caterpillars uh, produce uh, cocoons that will hatch into moths that will persist and lay more eggs and maybe uh, start a plague on the uh, black swallowwort. That would be the, the, uh, what we'd like to see. They tested this moth for years in Rhode Island in quarantine to make sure it wasn't going to eat all the plants, just the one plant that it was targeting for. And I don't know what that slide is for. I'm sorry. And uh, this is the moth, Hypena opulenta. Not something you're going to get wowed over, but uh, its caterpillars eat only that plant. So we're hoping that this comes through and uh, does the job for us and forms a control of an obnoxious invasive plant that we don't have to use chemicals and lots of labor to uh, rectify the situation. Now, the wetlands have been clogged. We're gonna look at a couple of invasive plants that you'll probably recognize. And as a result, we've lost some of the butterflies like this Harris checker spot, which uh, I had in my meadow for about the first uh, 15 years I lived here, but I haven't seen it since. And the vegetation in the meadow has changed tremendously. So. Uh, its food plant has uh, greatly diminished. It's still here, but it's really diminished. And uh, one of the causes of wetland loss is, or integrity is Phragmites, the European rush. We call it the uh, uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation flower in Connecticut, because wherever they dig up a little on the edge of a wetland, this plant gets in and in a short period of time, it will form pure stands, uh, clogging stands. It's an important plant, uh, plant from the um, estuary of the Danube on the Black Sea because it is used extensively for thatching where uh, thatching roofs is still used in parts of, of rural Europe. Uh, another uh, invasive that's really quite beautiful is the purple loosestrife. This was mainly uh, introduced into North America by gardeners as it's a form beautiful uh, member of any planted garden but it escaped and now it's clogging wetlands. We're trying to use some uh, beetles. There's two species of beetles that feed exclusively on purple loosestrife. And the plan is that they will reduce the loosestrife. They'll never really get rid of it completely, but they will knock it back so some of the other plants have a chance to join the community. So it's not totally elimination that we're talking about. I wanted to spend, it's, it's been, uh, it's actually 102 years. It's the anniversary of uh, Henry Bates. And if any naturalist there in the audience, his book uh, on, uh, on the River Amazon, Butterfly Hunter on the River Amazon, is a tremendous read. Uh, this guy went to the Amazon in the 1840s uh, when, uh, you know, it was really, you were taking your life in your hand. And uh, he suffered, his book is a tremendous uh, travel log on the natural history of the Amazon, and he also uh, he suffered quite a bit, I'll tell you, as a result of living there. Uh, the reason I'm bringing him up, I'm going to talk about him in conjunction with the monarch in a section, session, but his his notebooks, he was a tr really good artist as well as a naturalist, and he made wonderful notebooks in the steamy, drippy under Amazon jungle of the insects that he was studying, and Recently, uh, for the 100th anniversary, these uh, notebooks were printed for the first time. So your library might have some of them or they might be around. And if you're a naturalist, uh, you want to definitely check that, that out. Now, what is what was Bates talking about? Well, let's, let's look at here. Uh, remember I was telling you just a minute ago, okay, this took 40 years in Reading to collect half of the state fauna. So this is half the state fauna. If you double this size of this box, you got basically the state fauna of Connecticut. We have about 128 uh, butterflies. Here, this took one hour in the Amazon forest of Ecuador to collect this. 
to make this collection. So this shows you how the diversity in the in the tropics is just it's ten times what it is here. So it's really quite a uh, a difference and well illustrated by this uh, collecting period of time. And Bates, uh, you know, he was. He, he spent his time down there documenting really the first naturalist to travel to the Amazon. And uh, he also was the first to get the idea that some butterflies, either their caterpillars or the adults, are poisonous to would-be predators, most notably birds, but predators as well. Um, so let's look at this. This is Batesian mimicry. And this is a process in nature right here in Connecticut. We have this in our backyard. We have up top the monarch butterfly. The monarch caterpillars feed only on milkweed. Milkweed's a poisonous plant. If you don't believe me, go out and eat one and then uh, call me from the hospital. The white milk that comes out of it is a prisidine alkaloid that was used in, in colonial times to treat heart failure, uh, quite a radical treatment for heart failure. So this is a poisonous butterfly. Lincoln Brower, who is a, more or less a product of uh, the uh, Peabody Museum down at Yale. He was, I've met him many times. He passed away recently, but he was really Mr. Monarch Butterfly, going to Mexico and stuff all the time. Uh, he documented in really classic studies, birdcage studies with his wife, Jane Van Zandt, they documented uh, the poisonous of this butterfly. They had birds in cages, blue jays, which are very smart birds, incidentally. And they um, would feed them viceroys, the one on the bottom, which is perfectly tasty. And the, and, the, and the jays would be loving them. And then they'd feed them a monarch. And the next thing you know, the monarchs are vomiting and retching. I mean, the um, uh, blue jays are vomiting and retching. So when they're offered a viceroy, the lower one, uh, they don't take it again because they're afraid that, uh, that it could be the poisonous monarch. So this is the case of Batesian mimicry, where you have a, a, a tasty butterfly that mimics a poisonous butterfly. And as a result, it receives uh, protection from uh, predators. And this was a, a little mystery Bates unraveled uh, in his Amazon studies, which was very, very uh, uh, forward looking at the time. Uh, Batesian mimicry. And that kind of brought that up because of his anniversary and everything, a very interesting historical character. Okay, and we found this uh, also, we find the vice foreign monarch in our, uh, let's just look at that one more minute. I just wanted to talk about one more thing. Uh, the easiest way to tell the difference here, look at the viceroy in the hind wings, there's a line through the center of the hind wings. So I just mentioned this, uh, you know, if you're out in your meadow and you want to eat one, make sure you pick the one with the lines and the hind wings. Otherwise, again, uh, you'll be calling me from the hospital. So here we are studying uh, insects, pollinators in our backyard. And on the left, you see a fly, a member of the fly, the diptera. And on the right, you see a wasp. The wasp has a nasty sting. The fly is perfectly edible. A good food item for any insect eating uh, uh, thing. And you can tell, look, take a look at the antennas. Uh, they're very, uh, they're, they're, they're very uh, determining. The flies have short antennas. Uh, the hymenoptera, wasps, and bees have long antennas. Also, look at the wings. The flies are called diptera because they have two wings where yellow jackets and other uh, stinging insects have four wings. So those are the determining uh, factors that separate them. But if you're a predator, uh, maybe you're not going to take that chance as one flies by because you have to act instantaneously and you don't want to take a chance that you're going to get a, a stung. I'm very allergic to wasps and I've actually been stung in the mouth. A, wa a yellow jacket flew into my mouth and stung me. It was called the stung in the tongue event. Uh, and uh, I had to go to the hospital and my throat swelled up and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I'm definitely look at my hover flies very carefully before I'll dine on one. Here is the yellow jacket. Look at the long uh, antenna, uh, very dicey. Don't touch this thing, it can sting you nice. Okay, and this is the uh, or surfid. And look at the antenna, very short. And the wings, only two wings, not four. But it's a pretty good mimic of a yellow jacket. So this whole thing of Batesian mimicry is 
really throughout uh, nature. And as time has gone on, we've documented more and more examples of Batesian mimicry named, named after Henry Bates. And, and even the beetles get into the act. There's beetles in our meadow, uh, another species I don't have a picture of that quite, quite nicely mimic uh, yellow jackets. So uh, this whole mimicry thing is going on extensively right in our backyard. Now, you know, we're concerned about the pollinators because like I said, 75% of our plants are dependent on pollinating agents. So if we lose all our pollinators, uh, we, over time we're gonna lose 75% of our plants. All the fruit plants are pollinated by insects and numerous other important garden plants uh, and trees and stuff like that that we use for food are among those 75% of plants pollinated. Now let's go back to the turn of the last century, not the, um, not this century, okay? Again, trying to learn to say that. Uh, and let's look at the Christmas bird hunt. Around 1900, they had what they called the Christmas bird hunt. And everybody went out and shot and murdered all the birds they could find. And this pictures from then of guys and hanging a hundred birds. And I'm talking robins and swifts and little birds as well as big ones on the side of their barn to see if they could win the prize for most birds murdered. Uh, so this was the attitude and people came around and they started to, uh, uh, you know, think about birds and this tapered off to become the Christmas bird count where people now go out and count how many birds they see, not how many they can murder. Uh, and imagine doing this today. If I was murdering this hundred birds in my backyard, people would be looking to get me. Okay. So this is what the Christmas bird hunt was all about. And it became the Christmas bird count. That's very, really uh, pleasant for us to think about that birds went from this huntable item to a something we would cherish. And that's where we got to get with insects with our education. Here is something, I mean, no, this is not the set Bride of Frankenstein. This is a bug zapper. And this is horror in the backyard, indiscriminately murdering every insect that comes along, regardless of what it does, beneficial or not. So this is something, uh, you know, I would like to see us get rid of just as we got rid of the, uh, the uh, Christmas bird hunt. And this is invasive plants or something we've got to be thinking about and doing what we can to uh, counter them. This is a perfect example of what was a beautiful wet meadow in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and all that the edge of the wetland and then the, uh, the invasive Phragmites uh, uh, came in and just completely crowded out the wetland. So again, uh, this is the next plan. I told Lisa from the University of Rhode Island, we gotta find something to eat this. We have a few things that are eating it, but it, they're just not becoming a, a Phragmites pandemic, so to speak, you know? And this is what we want, you know? So let's look at this. Let's go back and just compare them for a minute. This is no diversity, lawn and Phragmites. And this is, uh, Lots of diversity. We've got our goldenrod, several species of goldenrods in late summer, Joe Pieweed. This place is the Crossfields uh, Meadow in Redding, loaded with uh, good bugs. So this would be something that we'd like to not only preserve the ones we have, but start stopping the disappearance of the ones we have and enhancing the pollinating environment. And you can do that right in your backyard. You don't have to have government intervention or a election or anything. You can just start taking care of your yard and learn about diversity for insects and pollinators and starting to follow that mantra. Or you can have this. This is, I ride through uh, New Haven and Darien and I see miles of this lawnification and we've been seeing it in Reading. People buy a nice old house with an acre around it and the next thing you know, all the big trees are gone, planted with little trees that somehow uh, you know, uh, suit the new owner and lawn to the horizon. And in their, in their yards, you're going to find uh, probably in their garage, a good helping of Roundup. Uh, you know, this is one of the chemicals that, you know, you can go to Home Depot and buy tanker trucks of this stuff uh, with no, uh, with no uh, supervision whatsoever. Uh, recently, I was a commissioner in Reading for 25 years on the Conservation Commission, and we had a big push to have ball fields. And they wanted to have ball fields with green, green grass, just like Wilton. And I said, well, what chemicals are you going to use? When I uh, uh, got the list of chemicals they were going to use on the ball field, 
uh, one of them was uh, 245D, uh, better known to most of us as Agent Orange in Vietnam. They're going to spray it on the ball fields in Reading and put the little kids out there to play on it. Well, I was immediately classified as a as a kid hater. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was told that they had experienced applicators, knew how to put this stuff on, and they would prevent people from playing on the ball fields by sticking signs in the dirt so that they wouldn't go out on freshly treated ball fields. Well, within a year, uh, someone forgot to put the signs up, one of the, uh, you know, uh, skilled applicators. And uh, the kids went out and we had burns on the dogs and the kids and everything from a pesticide application, not to think what it could do a young person genetically who's uh, still developing. So this is something we really want to take a look at. I was here in Will in New Canaan, Connecticut. Now, and, and you know, we're talking a lot of these people. The guy who owns this house, he's probably a very smart, educated person. Uh, he is for sure, you know, and and he's doing this, his environment. Uh, you know, and you just go, where what are you thinking about? I went to a place in New Canaan, a firefly preserve, and I was invited there. It's kind of a special place that's not generally open to the public, although you can find ways to get there. And I was told that this was going to have more fireflies than I've ever seen in my life. Well, you know, I'm pretty snobby about meadow stuff. And I knew I had some pretty good fireflies. And my, my uh, last year, my uh, meadow was really cooking with fireflies and people were coming over to see them. So um, I said, okay, I'll go down and check out New Canaan. New Canaan Firefly Sanctuary made my place look like nothing. I mean, I had never, I mean, Take my meadow and multiply times 10. It was like, you know, fireflies all over the place. And it was next to a house like this. And I stood on the stone wall that divided the property. To my left was fireflies lighting up the summer evening. To the right, you could not see one firefly. Not one ventured onto this desert. Why? I don't know. Was it chemical application? Was it just like doesn't have the food, the plants and stuff, the fireflies feel comfortable, but the juxtaposition was incredible. And, you know, one of the things we've done, you know, uh, after we got rid of the Christmas bird hunt back in 1900, we started putting up bird houses. And this has become, it's a minor industry really. And, uh, and Cornell University publishes, uh, you know, lists of sizes for bird houses and it's very specific. So we know a lot about this. This is something we want to start thinking about uh, for our pollinators, and I'll talk about that. This is uh, called Let It Grow, and this is my front yard. Uh, now, I know what you're saying. The Victor's really lazy, and he doesn't like to mow, and, and that is the truth. I will admit that, but I let the lawn go until generally uh, into the summer, and last year when we were doing our pollinator survey in May, we actually found more pollinators, more diversity in pollinators on the front lawn than we did in that meadow in the back. So that was a real eye opener for me. Uh, so anyway, this is at my dog in Reading. And what I'm doing to enhance bees, I got the, after my spouse had me build a ton of bird houses, I said, well, why not some bee houses? So uh, bees, uh, they like to uh, fill these things. They, they prey on noxious insects often like the wasps and some of the, uh, uh, the bees, um, the solitary bees, not the uh, bumblebees. And, and they fill these with mud. They put, they put a paralyzed a victim in there, a caterpillar often, and they, they put an egg on it and then they fill these with mud. So that's the idea behind my bee houses. And if you do do bee houses, there's a lot of this online, but uh, you wanna place them in a place where they're kind of close to mud because the, the solitary bees and stuff are gonna use mud to uh, seal these things up. And here is a really unbelievable solitary bee. Uh, uh, what's called a sweat bee, uh, working on one of its uh, places where it's going to put some prey items. Now, you know, these bees, I've, I've been a, a, a butterfly person most of my adult life, and I've done a lot of research on uh, swallowtail butterflies and bird predation and that sort of thing. And I was not really that much uh, grooved into pollinators until about a year ago, two years ago, when we started doing the survey. And uh, I've started to do a lot of microscope work. And I'll tell you, these things, when you put them on a microscope, they do you cannot imagine. So even in the time of this uh, awful pandemic, I've managed to have 
uh, some fun uh, opening up a whole new uh, way of seeing things uh, using the microscope, good powerful microscope. And this is a, a bit of our diversity of bees here in North America. And this is what, you know, as nature lovers, we're saving, we're doing stuff for our birds. We'd start doing stuff for our beads and stuff. That's what I would say. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my uh, profession and how this pollinating business uh, works in with that. Uh, I own a business called Monarch Painting. Uh, we're decorative painters doing murals and things of that sort. Our, our motto is metamorphosis is our business. Okay. And, you know, the monarch butterfly is just a symbol of that beauty. And I, uh, this is the lab at the Yale Peabody Museum where I go in once a week to work on the collections and stuff. And Roanne and my wife and I have donated many specimens from our world travels. And that was a wall. I saw those empty walls. As a mural painter, I hate empty walls. So I uh, put some kids and some dachshunds and some butterflies on that empty wall. And this is the entry to the collection now. Uh, and, you know, the silhouettes, I know there's probably someone in the audience that's saying, oh, that reminds me of Banksy, the artist who's just made a billion uh, doing silhouettes. And I'll just tell you, Banksy doesn't have a copyright on silhouettes. We've been doing silhouettes back since colonial times. So don't give all the credit to Banksy, okay? Here I am. I teach a, a workshop every summer, a children's mural class. And here we are. The girls have uh, photographed themselves. Uh, you know, because you gotta, you gotta have the iPhone. All these kids have iPhones, so you gotta work that into the plan. So they photographed themselves. We uh, made photographs, and then from that we made silhouettes. The girls made silhouettes of themselves and the silhouette of the docks and stuff, and the uh, monarch butterflies. And the whole week that we do this, we uh, talk about art and everything, but we also talk about the life history of the monarch butterflies. I'm trying to twist these kids into being uh, naturalists and uh, conservation minded. And the young woman on the left, Ruby, uh, when the newspaper came to interview the, the mural and our project in Ridgefield, Connecticut, she was so eloquent on the life history of the monarch. She had absorbed everything. So she became our spokesman for the project. And you see in the middle, Emma the dachshund there, who was a willing participant in the uh, mural. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay, uh, and getting close to the end here, I just want to go back. And you know, the the, the problem with all this uh, butterfly stuff is, you know, my kids, uh, we uh, we homeschool them at a time when homeschooling, you know, thirty years ago was not really accepted. So a lot of people were angry at us for doing that. But one of the great things we did is we would take long trips around the country. And my older daughter on the right, Mercedes told me when she was about 14 that she didn't realize that other families didn't go butterfly chasing on their vacation. So, uh, you know, I guess I had kind of twisted these poor kids to my uh, outlook. Uh, and this is the unfortunate happening uh, that butterflies are not all fun. They like salt, like all organisms, they like salt. And uh, this guy was sweating on the brow. So I put this tiger swallowtail there and it started drinking the sweat and it stayed there for more than an hour. Now he was not allowed to leave the walk, the butterfly walk until that, that butterfly was comfortable with the salt and flew off. So uh, this was the end of the uh, walk for him. I felt sorry. Okay, that's, the, that's all I got to say. And I'll entertain some questions if you'd like. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was so uh, so entertaining and interesting. So thank you, Victor. Um, uh, so um, I will open it up to questions. Anyone who has a question, please feel free to type it into the chat and um, I'll ask Victor um, your question. Um, I actually had a couple of questions if you're, if you're ready. <laughs> um, so do all butterflies only eat one plant? Um, uh, well, no, they, they are all different. And if you take like this tiger swallowtail we're looking at, and is you have the tiger swallowtail up on your screen there? Yes. Yep. The okay. poor guy. <laughs> yeah. The caterpillars for tigers. Uh, excuse me, my my uh, answering machine went off. I forgot to turn it. Off. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. This uh, Zoom problem. Sure. Oh, uh, <laughs> Here, maybe I'll mute you for a second so we don't okay. have to your call. <laughs>
Okay, you can just unmute when you're when you're ready. <laughs> Victor, can you unmute yourself? Or? He's finishing ah. now. Oh, he's still finishing. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> tiger swallowtail here. The cat that that tiger swallowtail that is incidentally a male tiger swallowtail, so it's not going to lay any eggs. But the female would lay its eggs in our area on black cherry and on tulip tree. So uh, this is a, this is interesting uh, ecology because this butterfly is dependent upon the nectar on the flowers that grow in our meadows, but at the same time, it's utilizing the trees that grow in the forest as the food plant. So you can see how the biology starts to get, you know, fairly complicated. Uh, farther south, the tiger swallowtail, which goes all the way to central Mexico, starts to use a bunch of other plants uh, for its food plant. So this plant, is, this butterfly is called uh, polygophus, uh, which means it eats many different kinds of plants. The uh, Tiger, the um, monarchs, on the, on the other hand, are only eating in the milkweed family. So you can have the whole gamut to, you know, certain uh, butterflies that will accept a wide range of food plants. Uh, the beautiful luna moth, uh, which some of you might be um, uh, familiar with, eats about half the plants out there. So, uh, you know, it, it varies. Every, every insect in this group has its own uh, specific uh, ecology. Okay. Um, someone asked um, that you says um, you mentioned that the monarchs will arrive in this area around May 10th. Yeah, we've been. Um, uh, yes, go on. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, th that and then also, but specifically, they were interested to know um, if the milkweed is up by then. I mean, what? what oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's coming up now. And I'll tell you a problem if you're planting milkweed watch out because the monarchs prefer the young plants. Uh, what they did in Rhode Island to investigate this, they took uh, existing meadows and they mowed half of them. And they, uh, so that, and they would do that in July. So that knocks down the existing uh, milkweed plants. And, but those older milkweed plants have very established root systems. So they will immediately start to grow again as young plants, they'll pop up. And they found that the monarchs vastly uh, prefer those new growth plants to the old ones. Because what happens, plants and caterpillars are having a, a battle, a running battle. The, uh, plants don't want to get eaten, you know, and the caterpillars are trying to eat more and more of them. So the plants develop these poisons to stop the caterpillars, but they're not totally effective. And they, young plants have almost no poison in them. So the monarchs take advantage of that and they can put more energy into eating and growing than they can in processing that poison, which has an energy a budget problem for the caterpillars. Is that too complicated or does that kind of- No, explain? that was fantastic. Okay. Um, so there are a few more questions um, that have come in and, um, and I'm actually sort of curious to ask more questions about the, the path of the monarchs, but we can come back to that. Um, Someone wants to know, um, how do you recognize good moths and butterflies and differentiate them from the harmful ones like tent caterpillars or, or even beetles that can ruin trees? So how, is there a way to differentiate between the beneficial and the harmful? Well, I can't look at an insect. I mean, just shooting from the hip, I can't look at a bug and say that's a good one or a bad one. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, let's take an example, the Japanese beetle, which is like, you know, one of the, a real garden you know, really hateful insect. And, but in our, in our pollinator studies this, this summer, last summer, we found a lot of Japanese beetles uh, visiting flowers and pollinating them. So although they're bad in most of the ways, uh, they're, they're, they have a good side too, like many of us, right? So um, it's hard to, you know, just classify a lot of things as just totally good or bad. Now, something like the, um, you know, uh, the, the longhorn, the Asiatic longhorn beetle, which is wiping out our forests, uh, is definitely bad because it's a, it, there's no natural resistance to this insect when it was introduced here, and now it's multiplying unchecked. Uh, just like that black swallow wart, you know, that's multiplying unchecked until maybe this hypena moth comes along and, and stops it. 
So basically what the insect is doing is what determines whether it's good or bad. And I'll have to deal with it on a case by case uh, study, you know. Um, another, thank you. Um, another question um, is, um, someone says, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and then also, um, do you um, have, or do you know of a place that sells milkweed seeds and um, that this person has a common milkweed garden and hand raises and hand raised monarchs and black swallowtails? Uh, someone there in an it's audience? A, Edna, it says, we have a common milkweed garden and hand raised monarchs and black swallowtails. Okay, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I don't know what I'm supposed to answer. There's a place up. I think they're looking for milkweed seeds. Where, where, where oh, can you buy them? Uh, we have, we had some milkweed seeds from our meadow, uh, which uh, my door uh, organized a mail out. And we provided milkweed seeds to over 120 people. We have most of those are now exhausted. I still have uh, some purple milkweed, which is a very rare milkweed in Connecticut. And if the person contacts me, we can supply them with some purple milkweed. Okay. And, uh, you can find me uh, on, I have a website uh, for my cleaning business, but uh, you can contact me, you know, you get the, my email off of that. Or I'll tell you right now, it's Victor Monarch, big surprise, Victor Monarch at yahoo.com. So uh, not hard, generally not a hard one to remember. Perfect. And it's, it's, is it too late to plant them now? That you, they need to be planted in the hole? No, no I, I actually stuck milkweeds in the, uh, ground uh, last July that I was, you know, growing in pots. They were kind of straggling. So I, I didn't get them out until uh, mid July and they really took and uh, they all seeded and flowered and seeded, uh, you know, about a month after they should have been. So uh, I've had good results that way. Uh, I mean, the best way is to um, the place where I, uh, Sammy and I were doing meadow survey, the, uh, Highstead Arboretum, they professionally raise milkweeds for uh, distribution to land trusts and stuff. And um, they, they think the best way is uh, cold framing, which they put the seeds uh, lightly under the soil and put them out in November and cover them with wood chips. And that they stay out all winter and they go through the, the whole cycle of freezing. The seeds of milkweeds have to be frozen. If they don't go through a freezing cycle, They'll never germinate. That's kind of a part of their life, you know. And uh, they find the cold, uh, cold framing is the best. So I had good results cold framing. I started a lot of my stuff this year in plugs. I've got a ton of stuff going uh, that I want to add to my meadow, uh, to our meadow. And um, I started them in plugs, and they're they're just starting to really take off right now. Uh, I'm thinking the next week is going to be helpful. Okay. Um, someone put a message in saying Wild Birds Unlimited in Brookfield is giving out free milkweed seeds on Earth Day. Okay, good to so know. Another place to... <laughs> what's, um, what's the name of that? Wild Birds Unlimited. Okay, I'm going to write that down because uh, people are asking me. Okay. Um, Someone asked, um, what insect lays eggs under leaves of lily plants? Oh, I don't know that. Don't know. Okay. Um, I mean, and you got an insect doing it. You got to catch the, the cook <laughs> that it work, you know. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the results of your survey that you did in your meadow? Well, right now we have about 2,000 insects that were collected from um, uh, flowers. And we all the insects are labeled uh, as a proper entomology collection. And they're also labeled to what nectar sources they were at. So if they were at you know, milk, uh, purple milkweed or uh, hyssops or whatever. So we have a record of the specific uh, plants that these uh, they were making flower visitations. We are still processing the insects. It takes time to process a collection like this. And all the groups have to go out to specialists. Uh, Kim Stoner and Tracy okay. Zerillo at the Canadian uh, Ag Station are going to do all our aphids, which are the pollinating bees, the solitary bees and the bumblebees and vice versa. Because that's where a lot of our interest is uh, kind of concentrating right at the moment is the the pollinating bees, although the other insects are definitely of interest as well. Okay. We actually had um, Kim Stoner speak 
um, at our library last month. And it was oh, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, she was great. Right. Um, so um, a question that I like to ask people who um, are in the pollinator business is, um, do you find or feel that the pollinator pathway sort of movement and, and the interest of a lot of people to, toward having gardens that um, that feed pollinators, draw pollinators, is it having an impact on the number of pollinators in the area? I mean, have, has there been a, a measurable increase? Look, here, this is what we're doing. We're establishing a baseline, you know, because no one has ever asked that question. You know, everybody went out and collected a bee here, a bug there, but no one ever took a habitat and collected it through a whole season. So part of the interest in this collection that we've assembled is that people can make those comparisons and start to say, you know, are the pollinators increasing? Are they decreasing? You know, what ones have we gained? What ones have we lost? There's also the issue of climate change and are insects not uh, previously found in this area, uh, you know, moving in here. I mean, we found that uh, um, things like uh, the palm magnolia, which was planted extensively as a, as a ornamental plant, uh, you know, for 150 years. In 1990, several popular, several individuals of uh, palm magnolias in places like, uh, you know, Massachusetts, which was way out of the range of where the palm magnolia originally occurred, natural populations which started turning up in the forests. So something that started as an ornamental and was grown because it was taken care of, it wasn't really occurring here, is now starting to occur here. So that shows you that the climate, the southern climate where that tree came from, might be coming here. And it's good enough, you know, there's been slight degree increases, and that's good enough to key this plant to start um, becoming natural, naturalized here and part of the forest ecosystem. So I don't know if I point you in the right direction, but uh, you know, I, at this point, I would uh, you, all I could say would be about a meadow is if I went out in some meadow and found a lot of insects, I'd say that looks pretty good. But how do those insects compare to a standard to measure it? Well, that's what we're trying to establish. Gotcha. Okay. And um, I, I want to be um, aware of the time. I know we're keeping you kind of late and keeping oh, everyone cool. late. Um, I did just want to sort of maybe you can tell us. Um, I'll sort of ask you um, uh, several questions and lump them all into one, which is, can can a person with a one or two acre parcel make a difference with their land? Can um, yes, yes. And this, what and what this and is a problem. This is a problem that is about us taking responsibility individually, not waiting for you know some elected official to come along. That's all great. But we've got to look at our own actions and we can change this right in our backyard. And I think what my spouse, Rowan, and I have done in our backyard instead of lawning, and we had people that told us over the years, oh, you'd have a beautiful lawn back there or something. You know, we didn't do that. And now that's becoming a treasure just because there's not that much left of it. We've got to take these areas that have been made into lawns and convince these people to start being concerned about pollinators like they're concerned about birds. I mean, I think this is a, you know, it's a paradigm change. And, um, you know, can we wait till, you know, 75% of our vegetation starts to decline because we can't, uh, they can't be pollinated? I don't, I don't think we want to go that far with it. So I'm hopeful that we're, we're getting a new consciousness going. And I do, I do encounter that maybe it's a bias of being who I am and who I'm talking to. But it seems to me that the idea is really starting to spread. People are asking me, about pollination and pollinators and your library is having me to do a talk on pollinating. And, you know, so, uh, and I'm not uh, by any means the, uh, you know, final resting place for this information, but, but I'm, I'm heartened uh, to see that. And children, you know, look, I, I had that 13 year old boy out with me last year, Lucas Curris, and he's become a nice little entomologist. And these are the people that are going to have to carry on and make their world a better place. We've made a lot of mistakes with it. So, Hopefully they can fix some of it up. You know what I'm saying? Sure. 
Um, so let me just ask the second prong of that question is what 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 do you think the most important things to do are? I mean, obviously you would advocate for not having a lawn, but are there specific things you should plant? Should you focus on getting rid of invasives? Should you not use pesticides? I mean, obviously probably all of those things, but if so, <laughs> all of the above, but if someone if someone needs to start, what where do they, what's the, what's an important starting point? Don't, don't rake up all your leaves. Don't rake them because up. leaves are important for uh, uh, pupating moths. And when those birds, you can feed birds all winter, but you're feeding them carbohydrates. When those birds want to reproduce in the spring, they're going to start looking for protein. Where do they get that protein? They get it from insects and especially caterpillars. So the caterpillars are coming from moths that pupated, they became cocoons and hid in that leaf litter during the winter. And also the leaf litter produces a rich, uh, you know, floor uh, complex. You know, a house doesn't have to have five acres of lawn. I mean, you can get by with a, a small lawn around the house. I still have a lawn myself, don't get me wrong. But, you know, you don't need two acres. We own two acres. You, I don't need two acres of lawn. Just a little lawn around my house is enough, and that's fine. And I, I see what people used to kind of call me not keeping things neat uh, now something that they want to emulate. They're stopping by and picking up milkweed seeds, although we've ran out of milkweed seeds pretty much, but uh, 120 people took milkweed seeds. So I, I think that that's hopeful. I'm, I'm being hopeful. That's what. Okay. I like that. I, I feel like that's a good place to end. <laughs> May okay. as well end on being hopeful. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. And I mean, I, I just want to say for me, uh, all this time with all the bugs has been a lot of fun. I mean, I love them. So uh, I think that other people, if they take the time to take a closer look, uh, like at things like those metallic solitary bees that I was showing you towards the end of the time, they're going to be wowed and they're going to be, you know, doing the Christmas bug count, although they're not going to find many bugs at Christmas. But, uh, <laughs> a 4th of July bug count. Have whatever. That. That's it. You got it. Lady. That's it. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no more questions from um, our audience, our participants, um, thank you. Thank I want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Signing out. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us. And we'll make the um, recording okay. available on the library YouTube page. Okay, good night. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>